Dirk says, do you see the danger of the sidechain markets being dominated by a very few big companies? Since I just answered, talked about sidechains, um, no, um, I don't. There are very few barriers to entry for this type of market, and there are very few advantages to being a bit big company in this particular space. Anonymous asks, could you please go more into the topic of sidechains? How would one go about creating a separate blockchain and connecting it to the Bitcoin blockchain in simple steps? <sighs> okay, so sidechains can be implemented in a number of different ways. The most common way is what's called a two-way peg, which is creating a special type of transaction in one um, uh, blockchain which locks up coins, which can then be referenced to unlock an equivalent amount, or uh, based on an exchange rate, a specific amount of coins in the other blockchain. Um, you can think of that as one form of an atomic swap, uh, because that's really what it is. And a bi-directional one would allow you to do a two-way peg, where you can move back and forth between the two. So you take coins in one blockchain, you lock them up, and when you lock them up, you can then release coins in the other blockchain at a specific exchange rate. You can do that with a two-way peg that's implemented as what's known as an SPV proof, um, and, and some kind of multi-sig smart contract. Um, or you can also implement it with Lightning Network, where you send a payment into the Lightning Network uh, on a payment channel where you own Bitcoin, for example. And you receive it on a payment channel where you have Ethereum. Now you can use Ether um, on Ethereum for whatever exchange rate you secured, uh, and you can move money between them. And so now you can implement functionalities where you seamlessly move coins to another blockchain without any intermediaries in a decentralized fashion. And that's what a side chain is. It's just another blockchain that is secured by a different mechanism where you shift your coins and you transmogrify them into this other coin. Anita asks, what is liquid and which use cases do you see? Um, liquid is uh, particularly what Anita means here is a uh, solution offered by Blockstream. And liquid is a side chain. Uh, and it's basically a sidechain that uses a federated signing model, or proof of authority, as it's called. So it's basically a sidechain that is not mined, but instead has uh, a, a group of uh, signers who uh, federate their signing, and they approve of transactions. And Liquid is it has a couple of features developed by Blockstream, including confidential transactions, which allows uh, the transaction amounts to be um, uh, encrypted, uh, but verifiable, so that uh, participants can uh, transmit value without revealing what value they're transmitting. The primary reason Liquid was created and the way it's uh, promoted is to be used as a back-end network that connects large exchanges and payment providers to each other, so that they can do uh, exchange to exchange transfers of liquidity um, without using uh, on-chain space on the blockchain, on the Bitcoin blockchain. And so liquid is, is intended to tie together lots of large exchanges and payment providers so they can use it as a back-end transport network. It's effectively the other end of the scale of Lightning Network. If Lightning Network is for um, uh, decentralized micropayments through millions of participants. Uh, Liquid is more centralized, federated uh, payments that are very large payments through a few very large providers. Um, and it's a it's a commercial product. Uh, so Blockstream sells uh, Liquid and um, manages the network and allows exchanges to uh, to use it uh, for a fee. So. Um, Liquid is a commercial product. It's open source, but it's still a commercial uh, product. Uh, ironically, one of the one of the big um, arguments about uh, or against Lightning Network is that Lightning Network is somehow uh, a Trojan product by Blockstream that um, and that they are sabotaging uh, the scaling debate in order to get Lightning promoted because they're going to profit from it. Um, and the irony here is that 
Um, first of all, Lightning isn't a, a, a Blockstream product. It's an open protocol. Uh, which has multiple implementations. And secondly, Lightning actually undermines Liquid, which is the commercial product from Blockstream. So um, the more successful Lightning is, um, the less need you have for Liquid. The bigger Lightning network gets, uh, the more uh, exchanges can use it to run payment channels between each other directly um, on Lightning without uh, having to use Liquid, which is the paid commercial product from Blockstream. So that kind of makes that argument uh, fall apart. So in any case, uh, this is a, a side chains project. It's probably the the first uh, commercially available side side chains project uh, created by uh, Blockstream. Matt asks, "What do you think of delegated Byzantine fault tolerance as a consensus algorithm? And do you think this kind of federated governance model can become effectively decentralized?" Um, Matt, I think that. Delegated Byzantine fault tolerance, uh, a consensus algorithm, where, uh, as far as I understand it, it is uh, a form of uh, signing where you assign votes to different parties, and in a federated model, you can delegate those votes to other parties. So it's a signing versus mining algorithm. Um, to me, the fundamental problem with consensus algorithms like that is that the uh, ability of the parties to collude and reverse the history of the chain is there. So with Bitcoin, one of the things to understand, let me rephrase that, with proof of work uh, consensus algorithms, one of the important characteristics of a proof of work um, algorithm is even if 100% of the miners decided they wanted to rewrite the chain from last year, they would still have to remine a year's worth of blocks. And they would still have to produce proof of work to remine those uh, blocks. They would still have to do that by consuming the same amount of energy approximately that they consumed over the past year. Mining chips have not gotten that much more efficient in the last year, which means that they would all of that energy twice, assuming it's the same miners, but only get rewarded once um, by rewriting the chain. That means that even if 100% of the miners decide to rewrite the chain, um, they can't actually do that without expending a very large amount of energy. Uh, and it would take a very long time. At current um, rates of difficulty, if they go back a year, it's going to take them less than a year to do it, uh, because the hash rate has increased significantly over the past year, but not much less. Maybe it takes them six months to rewrite the chain. And during those six months, they have to allocate 100% of the hashing power of the network to rewriting the past without moving forward at all. All of this just to rewrite one transaction that's a year old. That puts a very, very effective uh, floor or backstop against attempts to um, alter history. And that form of immutability to me is much stronger than simply assuming that the miners won't collude. In proof of work systems, even if the miners collude 100 percent, they have to expend the energy and produce the proof of work. Otherwise, none of the other nodes in the system will accept these blocks as valid. They cannot rewrite the chain simply by decree, by fiat, you might say. Um, in federated governance systems where signing has replaced mining, delegated Byzantine fault tolerance, uh, and even various forms of proof of stake, perhaps, um, then there is nothing backstopping them. I, if 100% of the signers collude, and in some cases, not even 100%, maybe only 50%, 51% of the federated signers agree between themselves, they can go back and rewrite everything since the Genesis block at zero cost. It doesn't cost them a thing. It doesn't take them more than a few seconds to recalculate the entire blockchain and arrive at a new present with a rewritten history that no one can independently and objectively see that it has changed. If a new node joins the system, they can't tell the difference between a history that is the original history or the new changed history. They both look the same. You can't do that in proof of work. 
a new node can join the system and immediately knows which history is true. It's the one with the most proof of work behind it. Um, in fault tolerance or some other federated consensus algorithm. And all of the well-known named federated signers of that model receive a subpoena that says, we would like you to please rewrite and erase this transaction that funded the WikiLeaks organization, that funded the whatever organization in the past, and uh, remove that transaction. That transaction never happened remove funding from that organization. Under a court order, they would have to comply. And more importantly, it's not a, just a matter of they would have to comply, they would be able to comply. The same scenario in a proof-of-work system, you hand all of the miners, if you can find them, a subpoena and say, change this transaction, and they can't. They simply cannot, um, without expending six months of energy, uh, which most likely most courts would not even approve. Um, under a variety of legal concepts. So anyway, um, that doesn't mean that federated signing and governance models and delegated Byzantine fault tolerance, things like that, are not useful. They're just different. They're not uh, immutable in the same way the proof of work is. So if you don't need immutability, if what you're trying to do is have a consortium of banks that don't trust each other, uh, be able to do wire transfers to each other, and you don't mind that uh, perhaps the government could come in and compel them all to change a transaction in the past and rewrite the history, then that's a perfectly good system. In that case, you don't need a blockchain. Um, and in fact, if you look at it, most of the systems that are moving in that direction, where they have delegated signing, they don't use a blockchain. They don't need a blockchain. They can use something else, a hash graph, a tangle, a a series of linked transactions without blocks. You don't need to aggregate things in blocks if you don't have proof of work. Uh, you don't need to have a system like that. You can basically sign every transaction independently. It's a more efficient system. So at that point, you're not in the blockchain space. You're in the distributed database space, and that's fine. Uh, it's just not what I'm interested in. <laughs>